Amen. 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 I, I got some praising preachers up here with me. <laughs> I got some praising preachers. Amen. God will send you exactly what you need. Not necessarily what you want, but what you need. Amen. 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 Brother James Gasson, do you feel all right? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Truly, God is in this place. Amen. And he's also wherever you're worshiping on Facebook Live or Zoom. We acknowledge our wonderful bishop, Bishop Samuel Lawrence Green, senior and supervisor, Phyllis N. Green. To the greatest presiding elder team in all African Methodism, presiding elder Philip C. Anderson and his queenly wife, Sister Sandra A. Anderson. To the best thing God ever gave me after Jesus, Sister Donna Black. Amen. To our worship leader today, uh, Reverend Curry, and to our ministry team, both those who are in the pulpit area and in the pews. We see you, Dr. Pearson. <laughs> to our board of stewards, board of trustees, our class leader council, musicians, students, ushers, ministry chairs, AV team, other officers, visitors, members, and friends, we greet you in the name of the Lord. We're in a sermon series for Epiphany, and we're seeing Christ or seeing Jesus in different parts and aspects of our lives. And so today I'm going to draw your attention to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we'll read verses 8 through 10. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always care around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. Let's pray. Lord, we need a word. A word that can change our lives for the rest of our lives. John Black doesn't have that word. So hide him behind the cross. Speak a word to him and speak a word through him that your people might be edified. Speak a word to him and speak a word through him so that someone will be changed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Taking the wise counsel of my, my wonderful wife, I've stopped using the title of um, drive-by sermons. Uh, and now we're going to have quick and dirty sermons. <laughs> quick and dirty sermons. So today is quick and dirty sermon day. Quick and dirty sermon day. And uh, throughout this epiphany season, we're going to look at Examples when Christ or Jesus is revealed in all the different aspects of life. And last week, we saw Jesus revealed in people that didn't look like us, talk like us, act like us. We can find Christ in just about everyone if we look, and we look with a spiritual eye. You know, if you think of Matthew chapter 25, when those who were uh, accepted as the goats or those who were accepted as the, the lambs, when they were asked about seeing Jesus, they said, when did we see you? We didn't see you. They said, oh, yeah. When you fed that person that was hungry, you fed me. When you clothed that person that was naked, you clothed me. When you visited that person that was sick and in prison, you visited me because Christ is in all of us. It's called the Imago Day, And if we get beyond our foolishness and look with spiritual glasses, we can see Christ in everyone. Even those who we don't quite understand and have a different cultural background than our own. Today, 
today we want to live with the notion that we can see Christ in our hard times, in our trials. Christ shows up and reveals Christ's nature to us in our trials. So as John Black is customs to say, put your seatbelts on. Drive by sermon number one. I'm sorry. Quick and dirty sermon number one. Quick and dirty sermon number one. Deep waters. Deep waters. My grandson, uh, he's been in the water ever since he was born. They give him uh, swim lessons every week. Every week he has swim lessons. And I've gone to some of his swim lessons, but... The last time he came, we went to Sun City Pool, his dad and I. We took little Eli, we dropped him into the deep waters. And you know what? Eli learned more about swimming in about 10 minutes than Eli had learned all his life. You know, he had all kind of little turnover skills and drown proofing skills before he got to us. But when we finished, he looked like a fish. You know, back in the day, they didn't spend, you know that minister, uh, people, they didn't spend any money on no expensive swim lessons. Papa took you to the lake, threw you in, and 10 or 15 minutes later, you were stroking that lake like it was natural for you. There's some kind of power in being thrown in the deep waters. Now, 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 let me just say this. When you were thrown in and some of us got that, instant swim lesson from Papa. When you were thrown in, yes, it felt like you were drowning. Yes, it felt like this was the end of your life. Yes, it didn't make any sense to you. Yes, but when you looked up through your water-covered eyes, you saw Papa there. And you knew that no matter what happened, Papa wasn't going to let you drown. Even though you thought he was a little late on getting to you and you were coughing a little bit, you felt that maybe Papa might have gotten off of his, his game. You still knew Papa was there. And you knew Papa would take care of you. Well, well, our heavenly Papa doesn't mind throwing us into deep waters. He, 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 he has a good sense of humor. And he just throws us in and he looks at us as we try to swim. And he smiles and he laughs. Because he knows he's got us. I'm, I'm a believer in, in, in the doctrine of sanctification or what we call spiritual growth. And I think that all of us as Christians ought to be growing, growing, growing. We shouldn't be the same. The works I did last year, I, I don't, shouldn't do those things anymore. The places I went last year, I shouldn't go those places this year. The things I did last year, I shouldn't do that. I should be growing in the grace of God. And, and one of the best places that God gives us to grow is when he throws us into deep waters. Yes, there are times that God just throws us right there in the deep waters. How, how, how many of you ever got a job you were wanting and hoping for, and when you got the job, you realized you weren't qualified for it? You didn't even know the language. It sounded like they were speaking Greek to you and they were talking about spreadsheets and P&Ls. What are you talking about? Deep water. But after you stroked around a little while, next thing you know, you're teaching the class. That's what happens when you get into deep waters. So some of us got into deep family waters. Some little girl, some little boy caught our eye, and we just all they could see the little boy and the little girl. But then we messed up, put a ring on the finger, said I do, and realized we didn't marry one person. We married the whole family, and the family was full of deep waters. Oh, y'all don't, don't y'all talking to me now. I can't hear anybody. You know I'm telling the truth. You had to learn how to deal with family systems foreign to you. And you know if you didn't deal with it, that little lady or that young man that you married is sure going to look at you cross-eyed. So, so that was deep waters. Some, sometimes that person you married is the deep water. Yet you wake up one morning and guess what? There's a Martian laying beside you in the bed or Venetian laying beside you in the bed. The person came from another planet. 
uh, they, they don't even know how to celebrate Christmas the way you do or Thanksgiving the way you do. They don't understand your value system or why you do what you do. Yes. Deep waters. Oh, yes, deep waters. And God doesn't have a problem putting us in the deep waters. Some of you went and signed up to be in a ministry at Campbell Chapel. And as soon as you got in that ministry, everybody forgot your email. When you sent the email back, nobody answered the email. When you called them on the phone, nobody called you back. When you made your budget, nobody showed up to budget meeting. When you made your calendar, nobody showed up to calendar meeting. Deep waters. Oh, but when you learn how to swim in deep waters, you can swim anywhere. Isaiah 43, 2, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. The flame shall not set you ablaze. I'm just taking the deep waters and teaching you how to grow in an accelerated manner. Oh, 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 pastor. Can you, can you help us out? Are there any deep waters in the Bible? Peter found himself walking on deep water. And as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus, he could walk on deep waters. And when he took his eyes off of Jesus, and when he thought he was going to drown, and it looked like it was over, guess what? Jesus grabbed him in the midst of the deep waters and brought him to safety. Is Jesus? Peter, the only one in the Bible? No, 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 no. There was a man named Jonah. God told Jonah to build a boat on dry land. Nobody ever seen a flood or heard of a flood. And Jonah was around there preaching about something that people thought never did exist or could exist, was scientifically impossible. But God called Jonah to experience deep waters. And for 40 days and 40 nights, the water came, and Jonah and his family were safe. Oh, yes, there was winds and waves, but Jonah and his family were safe. I want to tell you, when you're in deep water, it might look like it's all over, but God is with you, and you will be safe. I'll give the Lord a praise for quick and dirty sermon number one deep waters well that's no praise I'm preaching harder than y'all praising quick and dirty sermon number two metal on metal y'all get my age you worry about bone on bone right but, but, but now we're talking metal on metal. Uh, the Bible says iron sharpens iron. So one person sharpens another. Uh, another don't, one of those times when we feel that we're cast down but not destroyed is when God puts certain people in our lives that produces a syndrome I'm calling metal on metal. Y'all remember Ro uh, Diana uh, Flax, uh, Roberta Flax, Roberta Flax. The people who make you feel like she felt. I felt all flush with fever, embarrassed by the crowd. I felt he found my letters and read each one out loud. I prayed that he would finish, but he just kept right on strumming my face with his fingers, singing my life with his word, killing me softly with his song, telling the whole world with his word, killing me softly. There are certain people that come in, and they just rub us wrong. And God knows that. He put something on the inside of them that would cause the sparks to fly. Every time you encounter them, the sparks start to fly. Oh, don't, don't sit there like you don't know what I'm talking about. You know those people in your life that as soon as you walk in the door, in the room, in the vicinity of them, you know. Inside, the sparks are about to fly. 
Oh, how about that teacher? That teacher that gave everybody else an A but gave you a B and said, yeah, your paper was better than all theirs, but I just knew there was more in you than that, so I gave you a B. And the spark, you might not have said it with your mouth. You might not have showed it on your face, but on your heart, the sparks began to fly. Oh, 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 y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all know what I'm talking about. That, that supervisor you have that talks so sweetly to you. And you know the sweeter he or she talks, the more critical he or she will be. I, I, I had a supervisor could say the word chaplain, and you would have sworn it was a four-letter word. When he finished saying chaplain, you felt so dirty that you were a chaplain. You know that person I'm talking about. Every time you encounter them, the sparks fly. Some, sometimes it's a parent. Sometimes it's a teacher. Sometimes it's a supervisor. Sometimes it's a co-worker. Sometimes it's a classmate. Sometimes it's somebody sitting on the pew. Don't look left, don't look right. Somebody sitting on the pew right by you right now. When you walked in and you saw that person, everything in you wanted to go the other way because you know if it doesn't show in your face, it was still in your heart that the sparks are going to fly, metal on metal. God doesn't mind it. God gives us mentoring relationships that cause the sparks to fly because he realizes that iron sharpens iron. We don't learn anything from people who talk like us, walk like us, act like us, have the same background as we do. We learn from people who are quite different from us. Because that causes the sparks to fly. Oh, in the Bible, there was a man named Barnabas. And Barnabas was a wonderful mentor for a man named Paul. And when Paul needed to get into the church in Antioch, Barnabas was wide open to it. And come on, Paul, I'll get you in the church. I'll show you who you need to know. I'll get you all connected. I'll get you the right resume. Paul, you're going to be all right. And Paul was okay with Barnabas until a spark started to fly. Well, well you see, Barnabas had a nephew named John Mark. And John Mark missed the mark. John Mark missed the mark. John Mark missed the mark. And when John Mark missed the mark, Barnabas said, Paul, you're going to have to learn how to show some compassion. Paul, you're going to have to learn how to show some forgiveness. Paul, you're going to learn how to give people an extra, an extra chance. And you know what Paul said? In the Paul and Barnabas, beginning of Paul and Silas. Oh, it was a rift that went through the church because he couldn't handle the sparks flying. But let me tell you something. By the end of Paul's life, he realized just how wise Barnabas has been. And on his dying bed, he says, listen, there's a few things I really need. It's cold. I need my coat. I need my word. I need my word. I need my word. Bring the word. And John Mark. Bring John Mark. Barnabas was right all the time. But the sparks were flying and I couldn't hear Barnabas. I'm talking to somebody right now. I'm talking to somebody right now. I'm talking to somebody. Oh, y'all don't hear me. Somebody has let the sparks keep them from their blessing. That same person you pushed against is the one God placed in your life so that he can let the sparks fly and iron will sharpen the iron. Oh, give the Lord a praise for quick and dirty sermon number two. Quit laughing at me, Donna. <laughs> uh, that's my girl. Amen. Quick and dirty sermon number three. Fire. You know, when God puts us in the fire, we do feel as if he abandoned us. And, and you can take any of the scenarios I've given you, plus many, many more, and they all can be fire. Fire has to do with the intensity of the encounter. And, and God doesn't have a problem turning up the heat. He mimics that in nature. When the ancient Jews, the ancient Hebrews wanted to purify a metal, iron, silver, gold, 
they would heat that metal in a melting pot until the metal was liquid. And then they would scrape the impurities off the top and left the pure metal below. Now, it would be nice if they could just do it once, but if you look back in history, they would repeat this process and repeat this process and repeat this process until the metal had the right level of purity for whatever they were choosing to do. God loves to put us in the melting pot. And he lets the intensity, the intensity get into our situation to the point that we have melted down. Yeah, you have financial issues, but when you're in the fire, it seems like bills come from everywhere. When you're in the fire, paycheck doesn't show up that's supposed to show up. When you're in the fire, you can't seem to be able to make a zero-sum budget per Dave Ramsey. When you're in the fire, you don't know where to turn to pay for that financial issue. And it's there that God shows you a new you with your finances. Some of the best marriages had to go to deep marriage counseling because they were in the fire. Some of the strongest marriages are marriages when she walked out or he walked out and words were exchanged that could not be taken back. But God allowed that fire to kindle under them until they had liquefied and were ready to be purified. I'm talking about fire. Sometimes the fire gets into our spiritual life, and we realize that the little prayer life we had just can't get it done. Now I lay me down to sleep, just doesn't get it done. Bless mama, bless daddy, and bless my family, just doesn't get it done. And you learn in the fire how to pray a prayer that gets to heaven, how to pray a prayer that changes the life, how to pray a prayer that changes the world. When you reach your hand out in the fire, you know how to pray a prayer that God can use to pick you up and turn you around and place your feet on solid ground. Three Hebrew boys, three Hebrew boys were just living their life the best they could. They had no ambitions of doing anything big. They just wanted to survive. But let me tell you something. If you're really serious about living for Christ, there are going to be haters. The Bible says that. I don't know why people don't preach it. The Bible says that. When you live for Christ, haters are coming. When you stand up for what is right, haters are coming. When you do what God has called you to do, haters are going to show up. And the haters showed up and said, we're going to trip up these three Hebrew boys. And they made a statue of the king. And he said everybody had to worship the statue of the king. And you know the three Hebrew boys knew what the commandment says. The first commandment, the one that counts the most, said you don't have any other God but the one true and living God. You don't bow down to any statue just because your culture or your society wants you to bow down to a statue. And so they refused to bow. And because they refused to bow, they got put in the fire. And let me tell you something, the flames came, they intensified them because these folks were going through what God called the repurifying process. And when they came into the middle of the fire, it was so hot that the people who threw them in were suc succumbed by the fire. And yet, when the king came to see them, he noticed not three people. There were three. Four people were in the fire. And the fourth person looked like the Son of God. Let me tell you, you want to see Christ? Look for him in your fire. When the fire is on, he's right there with you. He won't leave you. He won't forsake you. When the fire is on, he promised to make a way out of no way. When the fire is there, he promised you that he will do exceeding abundant above all you ask or think. When the fire is coming down, he said, I'll be your way maker. I'll be your mind regulator. Oh, give the Lord a praise in the house today.